Oh, hey. Hey, it's one peg. What's going on? So, we had a new uh, Talking Tarkov podcast, number six. A whole lot of information got shared with the community. And along with that information, it seemed as though there might have been a little bit of confusion about a couple of things. So, what I wanted to do was make a quick little summary video just to go over some of the larger parts regarding that podcast and hopefully shed some light on some of the confusion that seemed to be getting experienced by the community as a whole. Now, even though I am the emissary for the United States for Battlestate Games and Tarkov, I want to be clear that the interpretations that I am sharing are based on my own personal assessment of this. It can change. It could be a little bit wrong. But I'm pretty confident that I'm pretty close. And if I did miss the mark, call me out. And I'll fix it. All right? Cool. On to the video. Okay, guys, so I'm kind of going to be going off the cuff with this. Uh, it's going to be unscripted. Hopefully, I don't trip over my words too badly. But bear with me because uh, there is a good amount of information here and a couple of like, really good points that I wanted to make, especially respective of the alpha footage that was shown for the flea market because I feel like there's an awful lot of confusion about the flea market that really needs to be cleared up. First and foremost... If by the end of this video, this is information coming from me that you guys consider relatively valuable, uh, shameless plug, I am the United States Emissary for Battlestate Games, which means that while I'm not going to necessarily be giving you guys information ahead of anyone else, I do get to receive all of the source files. I have direct access to the actual source high-resolution images and material that are actually being shared directly with broadcasters like clean so i'm not going to be skimming any kind of information off of somebody else's stream the stuff that i'm sharing with you actually comes from the source okay um but anyway if this is stuff that you find to be even relatively valuable i would ask that you please consider smashing the mother fuck out of that subscription button because your boy one peg would love very much to be able to call this kind of stuff his job. I want to quit my fucking day job. So help me do that. And subscribe, check out this stuff, you know, add a like, tell me I fucking suck in the comments and I'll try and make some adjustments and fix some things. You know, whatever it is that I got to do to make this kind of material stuff that makes you want to come back and check it the fuck out. Okay? All right. So, Talking Tarkov podcast, major points. Uh, there's going to be an implementation of a ranking system. But along with probably key stuff that we typically see in the, in the case of a ranking system is going to be stuff like KDR and, you know, who got the most headshots and that kind of stuff. But he said he's also going to include stats for players like the longest shot, maybe even the longest shot with open sites because that would be pretty sweet. Uh, most average money looted per raid would be kind of cool. Uh, who the richest player is right now, etc. All right. They also added things like the MP7, which you can see some, you know, really basic GIF style video uh, or GIF, sorry, uh, style video right here. Um, looks like it's going to be one of the more inexpensive SMGs, but it's going to have modifications to be able to put, you know, uh, ACOGs or uh, basic. Um, hollow sites, that kind of thing on the top, which is something that you can't do with the Keter, uh, as well as a foregrip, which seems pretty cool. Um, so it looks like it's Keter-ish. So probably my guess would be that it's going to have some kind of mid price point between what the Keter costs and what something like the MPX or the MP5 would cost you. Um, my guess purchased from Peacekeeper, right? Okay. So in addition to that, uh, there's also going to be uh, the ability to add uh, trading between players in raid only. So eventually, uh, the idea would be to have to risk your items at all points in this uh, in this world. 
not just by interfacing with some kind of UI system. For example, you would pick up your items from your stash in your hideout, travel to the trader or the person that you're going to be trading with, and trade. Uh, the question was raised regarding clan systems, and they said that the idea is to implement some type of clan or common stash to be shared between those folks. Okay? Um, they also said uh, the, the items would, at some point, not just have some kind of static, refreshed rate of respawn. Right, they said that the the spawn rates are going to be dynamic based on how much of something is in circulation. So TLDR: the more times you loot the 310 room for a Bitcoin, for instance, the less likely that that Bitcoin is going to continue to spawn as time goes on. Um, they showed some teasers for the MGL6. Uh, grenade launcher, which you can see here, is uh, as a series of images. Okay, um, you know, really cool stuff. Like they had barrel threads that were shown. You know, a lot of detail with the scuff marks and you know the stamping of the metal. Um, I actually really liked this one image uh, that they showed here, um, where like the selector had like you know these wear marks where it had worn away on the paint, you know, and and on the corners and stuff. Places that places that you would typically see like rubbing of the coating coming off first, like, you know, here on the metal where, you know, it's, it's rubbing on this back plate, just really, really cool detail. Um, you know, the, the guy Vlad that does this stuff is absolutely amazing. Um, let's see. Uh, they did say, uh, there was concern about the launchers, right? So what he had said was that launchers are going to be finite in nature. For instance, there might be 5,000 total in, in circulation ever, and that's it, Right which would force a shortage of them, which causes the price, the value of them in the marketplace to go extremely high, which would cause it to, you know, in essence, self-balance. He also said that the, the 40 millimeter grenades that are going to fit in these things, the ammunition for these things, is going to be extremely expensive and hard to find. Because if you think about it, this conflict is in Russia. So finding launchable grenades, launchable 40 millimeter grenades for this in Russia when they're United States made in nature, um, that should be pretty hard to find, right? There's not going to be an, a United States arsenal just kind of like hanging around for you to be able to pick your grenades out of. Um, they're going to be implementing different barrel lengths for the Mosin, uh, which I had a screen cap of where in the hell, um, where is it? Where did it go? It was here. Oh, right here. Okay, sorry. So, they're going to be implementing different barrel lengths for the Mosin. Right now, the Mosin's uh, current barrel length is this one. It's listed as a carbine, right? There is a longer barrel for it that they're going to be adding to the game, right? There's also uh, this uh, shorter OBER, OBER version, right? That uh, people love the idea of having this. But what we were told was is that if they can implement it, which is something that Nikita wants to do, is to make the OBER, the shortest barrel version, something that can fit in your pistol slot, which, you know, you pull the trigger once and that thing's going to go straight to the sky. I mean, the, the recoil on that thing is going to be just nasty. But it will be very, very cool to see implemented. Um, or, or, I'm sorry, the, the uh, OBREZ, O-B-R-E-Z, sorry, the OBER or something else. So they're going to be implementing the OBREZ uh, um, Mosin Nagant version. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, other, other images from the podcast. Um, there's this extremely cheap, uh, thermal reticle, uh, hollow site that's going to be added. Um, Nikita said that things in motion tend to have about a half to one second delay, but, uh, for, for close quarters combat situations, it could be extremely useful, especially in places like, uh, you know, Nighttime Factory or something like that. Um, there were also all of these other Mosin attachments. So we have this uh, bolt-on uh, flash suppressor muzzle. We have this additional grip, pistol grip. Um, there's this Odin Works Atlas Compensator. There is this uh, kind of twist-on compensator clamping mechanism kind of thing. There's this Monte Carlo Mosin stock. There is this Archangel Mosin stock, which I thought was absolutely beautiful. 
Uh, there's also this um, Archangel set of magazines that will go along with the stock. So it will be a mag loaded, um, you know, bottom fed mag loaded uh, scenario as opposed to having an internal magazine in the Mosin. Um, there was also uh, optics. So there's this Acon or, or ACOG uh, RMR um, scope, which I love the detail of this. This is actually pretty fantastic, like with, with the battery indicator and, and that kind of stuff. Um, along with, where are we? Um, there was some other optics. Oh yeah, right here. So we also have these additional optics, um, or this, the one optic, sorry. And they're just kind of showing the, uh, the opposite sides. Now I can't remember if this was, uh, NV or not. It might be, uh, an NV, um, another NV scope actually mounted to uh to a rifle which i think would be very cool if that uh, that gets added and then we had uh animated gifs of a lot of different things so here we have um our red bull can right the uh the energy drink one of the energy drinks we have um this <laughs> the uh the balm right the the gold star uh balm which i thought was hilarious that they added that it was a real pain in the ass to get open um, they also added uh, the, the canned meat. You got your Tashanka that you can eat with a spoon, right? Um, there's also uh, this morphine injector animation, which looks like it's, it's super fast, too fast. They're probably going to have to uh, slow that down a little bit in the, uh, in the real world scenarios. Uh, they also had the, the sippy bottle, as I like to call it. This is the, uh, the stream sniper sippy bottle. Um, because they need a sippy cup. And then we have the, uh, the juice, right? We got the pineapple or not the pineapple juice. I'm sorry. The pineapple juice is going to be a carton that has to get folded open, but we do have, um, this, uh, this pomegranate juice, uh, uh, box, right? Um, or carton. Let's see what else. Uh, was there anything else that got released? Oh, oh yeah. I can't forget Paul Bliot, right? We have our new scav boss. So this guy, his name is Killa, right? Right here. But one of the things that I really wanted to focus on in this case, which you, can, which you couldn't really see in the originating um, uh, photos unless you really zoomed in, was this stuff right here. So uh, they have this B-Hawk commando rig. So there's a commando rig, but it's black, which I really love. Then they have this RPK-16, which, is a, which looks like it's a, it's a new, new and improved gun, fellers. So I don't know... Um, what exactly the RPK is because I, I haven't looked into it. I, um, I come from, you know, a gun culture background, but I never had like formal military training. So I never got to learn or study about all of these different types of firearms. It's kind of stuff that I've been learning on the fly. Um, they did have, they did show a 6B13 vest, which I thought was very cool. But if you notice, it doesn't have any arms on it and it's been personalized with this killer thing on the, on the chest. So hopefully this is a lootable item and you could run around with this, uh, this modified, uh, Ford armor. Um, in addition to that, we also have this Masca 1S CH helmet, which is new and exciting. Um, but I love the aesthetics of this guy because if you notice, it's got the Adidas stripes painted over the top of it, right? And it's also got the Adidas stripes kind of on the sleeves. So this guy is, is the, uh, the meme of Russia, which I absolutely love. Like you got this old school, like, you know, uh, meme-ish uh, Russian mafia, like stereotypical dude in like the Adidas jumpsuit along with um, all of the armor over the top of it. But he, he added the Adidas stripes to the helmet, which I, I think is, is absolutely hilarious. So we've got Killa slash uh, Paul Bliot. Uh, which, if you guys don't know, is uh, Paul Blart, mall cop, right? So we've got Paul Bliot, the uh, the scav boss of of Interchange, which I think is just really cool. Um, okay, so finally, we've got the flea market alpha footage, right? And I'm going to spend a minute on this. So there's a lot of confusion that people seem to be expressing, um, and, and there was some clarification that was made on the podcast, but a lot of people didn't catch it or they couldn't make the podcast, which is fine. But... I wanted, to, I wanted to review this really, really quickly, okay? There's a couple of pieces with this that are very, very cool. Um, eventually, 
the flea market and the cost of the items associated with what is sold, what items are sold for on the flea market, are going to have a global effect on the cost of the items, even from NPC traders, right? And that's important. Think of this as EVE Online's player-run economy, right? The, the ultimate vision for this is that the, the economy is going to be completely player-controlled. So you will have instances, no doubt, of market manipulation, price manipulation, right? You're going to see bars and knives at one point in time probably selling for 100,000 rubles a piece just because people with enough money will be able to manipulate the market. And this also will, will generate people, uh, players that are going to be like quote-unquote trader players, merchants that will influence and even attempt to manipulate the economy, right? But the way that this works right now is not like the World of Warcraft-esque auction house system. It's not built that way. If you notice, there's a separate tab at the top that says auctions. This is not an auction system. This is not eBay. This is not a World of Warcraft buy it now offering system kind of thing, right? The way that this is going to work right now is a player will list an item for sale on the market, just like how it's shown here, okay? If you decide that you want to buy a marked room key for 15 cans of Tashanka, what's going to happen is, is that you have to load up your 15 cans of Tashanka, and the trader has to load up their marked room key, and you guys have to meet somewhere on the map and make that exchange. When you make that exchange... There's going to be a reputation system in, implemented in this that is going to then influence the reputation of not only the person making the offer, but also the buyer as people that are good traders, right? That reputation system is going to feed back into this flea market. Not only if you are able to offer stuff, but also be able to offer stuff at certain quantities. So... Nikita mentioned something about being able to have a, an ultimate cap of somewhere around 100 listings for a player with, you know, to kind of top of the line reputation. You know, these these trader merchant esque players that really want to just play the the, um, the the market all the time, right? So this will be a situation where you can't just do like a set and forget and walk away kind of setup, right? When you want to. Uh, purchase an item or list an item, as you can see here, there's going to be like this chat function that's going to pop up that says, I would like to buy your stuff. Think of this more along the lines of like Facebook yard sale listings or Craigslist, right? You're going to list an item on Craigslist for sale. You have to make contact with the person that says that they're looking to buy the item from you. And then you actually have to either meet up somewhere and do that exchange or they would have to come to you and do the exchange, right? But you still have to physically do the exchange. So this is something where you're going to have to be online and delivering items. It's not going to be something where they're going to make that purchase and then you're going to be able to exchange this stuff through the messenger where it's going to show up in your inbox. Not going to happen that way, okay? Eventually, and this probably will not be 0.11, maybe 0.12, who knows, there's going to be an auction house system that's going to be implemented where that would be the case, okay? But right now, that's not how this is going to work. Right now, this is done in person, okay? And I want to make that extremely, extremely clear. Um, one of the aspects of this that I thought was very cool, though, that they did mention in the podcast is that there is kind of like this handbook-esque system where you'll be able to kind of mark down a build for a weapon that you've modified, right? So let's say you get to uh, minimum recoil specs on an M4, right? You can catalog that and all of the modifications that are made by spec. And then you'll be able to share that list of modifications with other people, which is kind of important because when you go to list items on the auction house in terms of the modifications that are on items, you'll be able to then use that 
and go to the auction house and have all of the gear mods that you're looking for kind of listed as this filtered list of stuff and then be able to purchase those individual pieces and parts to modify your M4. But be kind of aware that it's going to take time much longer than if you were going to do it through the traders to be able to obtain those modifications if you're not buying them all from the same person, right? Okay, so hopefully that clears up all of the stuff uh, regarding that system. Um, eventually, they're also going to be implementing dependency systems for um, me the mechanics of medications, meaning that you'll be able to take stimulants that will augment your abilities perhaps later. Um, but if you overdose on stuff like that or morphine, you could pass out and die from it in the raid. So you, you can dose yourself, but you can also overdose. Uh, medical kits eventually are not going to heal your hit points instantly. Eventually, what's going to be happening is you'll bandage yourself, and then it will kind of like augment your natural ability to regenerate, okay? Um, he also mentioned that there's going to be a wipe in a couple of weeks, that they're going to be doing uh, a wipe of your personal level and your stash, but... Trader reputation will be unaffected, and they possibly will wipe skills, but they're not sure yet. Um, regarding the anti-cheat system, which is another big one, regarding the anti-cheat system, uh, they do not use any type of, of marketed anti-cheat prefabricated uh, system that uh, other really popular games use, right? So uh, they don't use any of those. What Nikita said is that they evaluated them and they didn't like any of them. So they made their own. They developed their own engine that Nikita says works better than any of the marketable engines that are out there. And because he developed his own engine or they developed their own engine, because it's proprietary, they don't want to release the particulars of how those anti-cheat systems work that they built, which makes sense. And because of that, um, they also don't want people reporting who the cheaters are. Because if the community knows who the cheaters are, or if the cheater themselves know that they have been flagged for that cheating, there's a possibility that they could get a clue in on what they're using to detect the anti-cheat and then counteract it, right? So it kind of makes sense that they don't want people, you know, quote unquote, talking about it or calling other people out, um, you know, for whatever that's worth. Now, lastly, we have screenshots of Terra Group Labs. And this place looks fucking cool, kids. Oh, does it look cool. So we have this secret underground laboratory that is self-powered and lit and beautiful and high-tech, right? And we've got all of this, you know, footage of underground like server rooms and, you know, loading docks and, and all of this really cool laboratory-related stuff. And it's super industrial, and we were told that it's about four times the size of factory, which still keeps the map on the smaller side, right? But this is going to be, like, much more fast-paced, tactical-esque combat, and Nikita said that it's looking at, like, 10 to 11 players. Now, in addition to that, he also said that there's going to be, like, this elite task force-ish style of SCAV, this, this paramilitary, even XPMC-type scav squad or squads that are going to basically hunt you down and they're going to work in coordinated effort style groups so you you'll have like these dumber or dummy down scavs in places like customs but then you'll have like these three or four man units of highly coordinated infiltrative scavs that are going to look for infiltrate find and hunt and kill you which i thought was so, so unbelievably cool. Um, and I think, I think that may do it. Oh, uh, last but not least, the SVD, okay, the Dragonov, is scheduled to be, be released uh, for 0 0.11, 0 0.11, okay? Um, can't wait to see that. That is going to be amazing. Uh, but anyway, so that is the TLD version of the EFT podcast with hopefully some clarifications on the flea market uh, alpha footage that was shown and what the flea market is going to be. Hopefully you guys found this relatively uh, good, exciting, informational, educational, blah, 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 blah. 
And uh, we will be able to see you people at the next installment. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to check this shit out. My name is OnePegMG, and I will see you, hopefully, next time. 